next in our lecture series, uh, a lecture by Dr. John Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller is the medical director at Partnership Health Center, Missoula, Missoula's Community Health Center, and an associate clinical professor and associate program director for clinical operations for the medical family medicine uh, residency program in Western Montana that is sponsored by the university. During the late 1990s, he completed his master's degree in public health at Harvard University with a concentration in international studies. He completed a medical school rotation and a field research project on bus safety in Guatemala. And that's uh, what he would like to revisit for his contribution to the lecture series. So the title of uh, John's talk is Improving Road Safety in Developing Countries. Great. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right, good. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, well, thank you, Peter, and thanks for getting all the technology together. I appreciate that. Um, it's nice to be here tonight, and thanks for coming. Um, first, just to talk about the objectives of today's talk. First, we're going to talk about uh, global health in a local context. I think a lot of us, um, maybe a lot of the talks to this point, when we think of global health, we think of going overseas, going somewhere different, and an experience there. And I've got some of those experiences to relate here also. But I've also been invo involved in a lot of local global health um, experiences that I wanted to um, uh, discuss with you all today. Then we'll talk about the, uh, the scope of road safety as a problem in the world, in the United States. Then we'll discuss the situation in Guatemala, how I got interested in some of the work that I did on it, and then um, we'll visit the WHO report from 2013 that talks about specific strategies for improving road safety uh, in the world. First, it's important to think about global health uh, broadly, to think that uh, global health issues transcend national boundaries, so a lot of global health issues uh, are very pertinent to life here in Montana. That's part of why the University of Montana is so motivated to around global, uh, the global century to get people involved not just overseas but also to better be able to uh, impact the lives of people here in Montana. Global health is around in, uh, improvement of health and then reduction of health disparities uh, in our own country or uh, other countries as well. I did a lot of medical school experiences overseas. I was very interested uh, when I became a doctor in working overseas, but uh, with student loans that I had, uh, I didn't see how f it would be f uh, financially po feasible or possible to work overseas. And so my wife and I identified a, uh, a way to work in a different culture with different people, uh, a different way of life, um, in some ways feeling like we were in a foreign country here in the United States. And we worked for eight years in the Indian Health Service in Zuni, New Mexico. And um, that was a really great experience where I, I feel like I've got a lot of the experience uh, to be able to uh, understand global health issues as they relate to uh, life in Montana. So whether you're working uh, on an Indian reservation or in an urban uh, Indian center like we have here in uh, Missoula or at a homeless clinic. Uh, and the Partnership Health Center runs a homeless clinic uh, in, in the Pavarello Center or a migrant clinic like where uh, is being established in Lolo and is uh, present every summer up in Flathead run, run out of uh, a van that run, goes to different areas as people are picking cherries. There's a lot of opportunities to get involved locally in global health issues. You don't have to fly somewhere to get involved in these questions. So turning to bus safety, uh, a lot of what's talked about here and kind of the format for the slides and some of the slides that I'm using are taken from the global status report on road safety from 2013 put together by the World Health Organization. They have a great website with a lot of information so as you guys are putting together your paper there's a lot of information there about uh, particular countries. 195 countries take part. Um, I think it's like 20 or 30 countries that uh, don't take part and uh, you know, I'm trying to think of Eritrea as one of them, it's just some smaller countries. So it really has a lot of information about uh, road safety throughout the world as 
0.6% of the world population live in these 195 countries. The data that's collected is country-based, um, and there's different sources for how they get that together. When they talk about fatalities, I think the information is pretty reliable because uh, a death is such a major event. I think it's more difficult to deal about road safety in a larger context when it doesn't involve fatalities, such as injury rates and this kind of thing. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm mostly talking about death rates, and I think from that, the, the data is somewhat reliable. So uh, who all has a cell phone with us or the ability to send a text? Can anybody send it to raise your hand? Okay, take out your cell phone, okay? We're gonna make this interactive to start. Okay, this is gonna be a, a little different. So, what I'm gonna have you do is text to this number. That's the number you wanna text to and answer the question here. So, what the question is, what was the leading cause of death among Peace Corps volunteers from 2007 to 2011? So if you don't mind texting your answer, you call that number up there, and then you text in which one you think is the most, the best answer. You have a question? I can't see the number. Okay, uh, you might move forward. You can move forward or you can not participate. It's your, you can. <laughs> I don't see a way to blow this up unless somebody, yeah. Nice. So this can get 40 responses, and there's at least nine of you in the room. So, oh, we're up to 13. Okay, so we'll, we'll close polling on this question. And this is kind of a giveaway. It's good to start, build everybody's confidence to start with here. And um, so there were 17 deaths from 2007 to 2011 among Peace Corps volunteers. And seven of them were, so 17, seven of them were auto accidents, okay? Uh, there's actually a a few homicides, unfortunately. Some, uh, a couple of them got press were uh, by one Peace Corps volunteer on another. Um, kind of interesting data, sad, but interesting data to, to think about. Um, let's see, so next we're gonna go to the next poll. So I think this is to the same phone number, uh, the 2233. Three, two, two, three, three, three. So here's what is the leading cause of death worldwide among people ages 15 to 29, okay? So take a second to answer that as best you can. Okay, again, we're building your confidence here. This is uh, a similar to the other. So it's uh, actually among all age groups, it's the eighth leading cause of uh, death in the world. Um, and among young people in, that age, in your age group, um, it is the leading cause of death uh, worldwide. Let's see, so the next question, here we go. Okay. So this is a live, stick with the wording here, okay? This is a, a little bit of a trick question here, but for every fatal traffic-related injury, okay, how many non-fatal injuries occur? Okay, so you can imagine this is a little bit of a round number. We got some round numbers here. Uh, we got one odd number and some even numbers. I'll let you answer. All right, you guys having fun yet? This is pretty great, huh? Okay, so, all right. So we really don't have the right answer up here. Probably I don't know is the right answer because again, like I was saying, when you get into non-fatal uh, injuries, it's really hard to know. People, um, somebody runs into a bumper or something like that, do you count it, this sort of thing. So it's an estimate, but uh, the estimate is 20. Um, so I've got a slide on this, so I'm gonna, Toggle back here for a second. So this is a WHO slide that basically said that try to show the magnitude of this problem. So when we talk about fatalities, that's a, a major problem. But also when we look at uh, the 20 that are injured for everyone who dies, uh, you know, that's a major issue. One in 20 of those who are injured are left with a permanent disability. 
And, um, and then it, this slide talks a little bit about what, are, what some of the country's abilities to deal with uh, uh, injuries that occur. 111 of them have uh, a national access emergency number like 911, that kind of thing. 59% of countries have ambulance services, or 59 countries have that. Um, and then I think the key thing, the point they want to, uh, that is pertinent to this slide is the fact that not all doctors, not all medical personnel know how to deal with the problems that come up from, um, from uh, traffic injuries. And so that's a, uh, a concern uh, in a global context as well as in the United States and more remote areas. So now we're going to go back to the next question. We're going to toggle back and forth, so I appreciate your patience. Next one here. Okay, so these are going to start getting a little bit harder. So which region of the world has the highest annual road traffic fatality rates? Okay, so what region of the world? Not continents. Okay, we got one continent there, but then we were thinking regionally here. Okay, so I'll give you a second on that. Okay, so it looks like the votes are in, and Southeast Asia looks like it's coming in uh, first with the Africa and the Americas in there, um, running close. So here I've got a slide about, I'm uh, messed up here. There we go, sorry. Got the answer to the next question <laughs> uh, there because it's a little bit out of order. But basically, so Africa, as you can see here, has the highest rate of road traffic fatalities uh, per 100,000 population. Okay, so 24.1. Interesting, they put this slide, this is a WHO slide. They didn't put the second highest region, which is in blue here. Light blue does not have a bar. It's about 21, about 21 deaths per. Uh, 100,000 population. Africa is among the highest. Southeast Asia, the Indian subcontinent, um, uh, and then the Americas are here. Europe has the lowest number, but it, interestingly, it has the broadest range. It has some countries that have as low as 6.3 deaths per 100,000, and then some of the countries like Albania have uh, rates that are more like 20. Um, deaths per 100,000 population. So much more like Africa or the less developed countries uh, in Europe. Okay, so let me see how I can toggle back here and uh, we're going to go back to the next. Oh boy, hello. We're having some technical difficulties, but we're going to get through this. It's worth it to have a little bit of interaction if we can do it. Whoa. Okay, we may need to stop our polling. Let me see. Uh, polls. Okay, we're going to go it a different way here. Not to throw in the towel quite yet. All right, so here's the question. So countries with which level of income have the highest annual traffic fatality rates, okay? So is, is it high income levels like the United States, middle, uh, which is like Kenya, um, Guatemala's in that category, or low, those that are very, very poor. So which, which level of income has the highest annual traffic fatality rates? Okay, so a, couple, a few votes for low, and then uh, 12 votes for middle. And people might have seen on the previous slide that, there we go. So middle income countries are hit hardest. And I think part of what has to happen is people have to have cars. So really, the low income countries, there's not very many cars. Uh, maybe there's buses or this kind of thing. 
um, but not so many cars. And it's often at a place where pedestrians and cars come together. So even though a lot of people in the uh, wealthier countries, the high income countries, have cars, okay, it tends to be that the pedestrians are separated from them. There's also some other reasons that we'll get into why um, middle income countries are hit harder than high income countries, but I don't want to give away the whole talk in the first slide, okay? So we'll keep going here. Uh, let's see, back to, let's see if they'll give me the next poll here. No, we're not gonna do that, okay. Okay, so now we're going to the United States. So we talked about local global health. So we're talking about the United States here. So which state has the highest traffic fatality rate in the United States? Okay, is it Mo Alabama, Mississippi, Montana, or Wyoming? Okay, here's your opportunity. I'm hoping we'll get more votes on this one because, you know, there's some home state pride here to hold up. Yeah, we have a hometown crowd here. It's, uh, so the answer, whoa, hello, what did I do? Okay, good, the votes are still coming in, that's excellent, okay. So the, the, actually the right answer is Wyoming, okay? They beat us out on that one. Um, let's see where I'm going here. So this, this map has, uh, it shows the U.S. Tra uh, traffic fatality rates. I don't actually have the cue but, or the key for this, but just to know that the ones in the red are the highest, the ones in the green are the lowest, and the ones in yellow are in the middle, okay? So there's a huge range of traffic fatality deaths by state in the United States, way more than the countries of Europe, okay? So in D.C., D.C. has the lowest, District of Columbia, our nation's capital. Uh, it's less than four traffic deaths per 100,000, okay? So that's the lowest, lower than any European country like even Luxembourg or one of those nation states in Europe, okay? And then the highest is Wyoming, which is at 27 traffic deaths per 100,000, which is higher than Africa, you know, as a continent, more in Wyoming. Yeah, you have a question? Sorry. And we'll get to that. Yeah, so the question was how much of that is related to drinking and driving and not to give, again, the whole, we're still in the polling section of this talk, yeah, uh-huh. Um, pedestrians included? Pedestrians included. So any fatality involving road traffic, mm-hmm, yeah, okay. So Wyoming comes in fifth in this, okay. The uh, Deep South is like second and third right down here, okay, and then uh, Montana, has the, um, the, the fifth, which is about 19 deaths per. So it, it, that, like, it's higher than the average among the Americas, for example. Like, so when you think of Central American countries, that kind of thing, uh, you know, it's skewed a little bit by District of Columbia, which brings down the average, but anyway, so that's there. And then we have, I think, one more question on the polling if it'll give it to us. No, okay, so we have to kind of go the long way here. Uh, which, da, 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 da. No, I think we already did that. So sorry about that. We got, went a little out of order with that. So uh, we will get back to, that's about the end of the polling. We tried, we did some things. So that brings me to this slide, okay, which is the United States of Shame, okay? This shows Wyoming's place as the highest number of fatal car crashes in the United States, okay? Montana is up there, uh, has some problems with some issues. And this is, you know, just for a little bit of comedic relief in the middle, transition point says, okay, we're gonna move on and talk about some other things, okay? Uh, this is available on the web if you wanna look at it more. All right, so next I'm gonna talk a little bit about the situation in Guatemala. And some of you might be asking, why, why is this person interested in road safety? And so that's what I'm gonna to hear to talk to you about. First of all, 
The buses in Guatemala are incredibly beautiful, okay? They're all these, uh, or there's a lot of these old uh, U.S. school buses that get sold and sent down there, and they're very beautifully put together with a lot of things jangling, and uh, they're all pretty much individual works of art. Uh, and so I found that really interesting when I was there. I thought it was a beautiful part of what I saw in Guatemala. And the other thing is, as you spend very much time on the chicken buses, you can see that safety is a big issue, okay? You can feel it, you can kind of know it. And so when I first traveled there, uh, it was between college and medical school, so not so different than your stage of life where you are right now. Uh, I was, you know, me, my size, whoop, sorry, trying to, trying to fit into this kind of situation. So that, that was kind of uh, a challenge and I thought it was interesting. So some of you may have been to Central America and may know about the Gringo Trail, okay? So that's typical that someone starts up here, they wind their way from kind of the major things to see, okay? I wanted to go a little bit different. I hit some spots on the Gringo Trail, which is like Tikal, which is beautiful Mayan ruins, Puerto Barrios, which is a Garifunda community, so a lot of Caribbean culture uh, that was very interesting. Uh, around Guatemala City, uh, there's a lot of history, like in this city called Antigua, that's very beautiful, a volcano that's active called Volcano Bacaya. I mean, you could just go on the Gringo Trail and have a really great time. But I wanted to go a little bit different and go up, I wanted to go kind of this way, which uh, there's no real way to get there, but I wanted to, you know, I was 25 and, you know, I wanted to see it. So I went that way. And so this is the way I went from Way, way to Nango to Coban, uh, Coban, which again is across like this right here. Okay, so pretty good distance standing in the back of a truck. Luckily, I don't think this was particularly dangerous because it was on mostly dirt roads that were kind of potted. It was good to be standing because you could be your own shock absorber, that kind of thing. Um, and you couldn't get very fast. So it, this was actually probably a pretty safe way to travel uh, when. Uh, I went on the back roads that way. One thing that people do a lot there is ride on the top of roofs, and that this is very common in the trains of India. I don't know if you guys have seen pictures of that, but it's uh, pretty interesting to see. Um, I was invited onto the roof one time when it was super crowded inside, and so I was up on top of the roof, and this one time, uh, unaware, this big branch hit me and nearly took me off of the top of the of the roof and I, I got hit harder than I ever remember and I played like middle school football. So I didn't play high school football, so who knows. But uh, so people got hit, it hit me hard. I really hurt, and, but I didn't get thrown off and I was okay. So that percolated. I went away for a while. I, went, I studied uh, public health at, uh, back east and um, I had the opportunity to spend 10 weeks in uh, a rural community, again off the Gringo Trail in San Juan Sacatepecas. So this is in medical school, 10 week experience, mostly working in clinics, but I got uh, public health credit for this, so I had to think of something to do. So I decided to study uh, bus safety. So do a whole lit search, read about bus safety, and then study it on the ground. That's what I decided to do. So San Juan Sacatepecas is right here. So if you're on the Gringo Trail, it's just north of Guatemala City, just a little bit up, okay? So actually pretty close, probably about a half hour, maybe an hour on a chicken bus, and we would, that's the, the main way that uh, we traveled. The thing to know about the chicken buses are there's pilot, pilotos, and ayudantes, okay? So the pilots are the drivers and their helpers, okay? The organization of the bus scheme is mixed. Some pilots are pretty wealthy and they own multiple buses and they hire other pilots to run their buses. Uh, others just have their one and they don't, they kind of compete with the others. Uh, the pilots make more money than the ayudantes, but there's not a ton of money to go around. They don't, there's not a lot that they make in the bus fares. There's a, a few routes that they all go on, and so there's a fair amount of competition uh, that we found. Um, so what I was looking at was trying to, first, trying to understand how the system works, talking to them, try to, in my best Spanish that I could, understand what was going on. Um, with how they were organized, um, 
Most of them were independent operators who did, uh, they or a family member did the artwork on their bus, uh, and this was their big investment in their life, and this is their livelihood. So I was able to identify a few different things that led to the problems in Guatemala, just on the chicken buses, what were some of the issues. So one was the overcrowding, okay? So right here is some vomit on the floor, okay? One time I ate a spoiled egg. This was on a short bus ride, but I ate a, a rotten egg, and I felt kind of sick going on, so I brought a plastic bag with me, but then I vomited pretty close to Guatemala City, and it was really pretty crowded bus, but, but when I vomited, like, there was a ton of room all of a sudden. I mean, it was really, really awful. So, sulfur smell, um, but bad things happen. You can't see outside. If you're a little bit sick, it makes you sicker. Uh, this kind of thing, kind of hot and uncomfortable in there. It's overcrowded because these areas aren't well served by buses, and so everybody's trying to get to the place that they're going, so people will pile in, keep piling in. When people are overcrowded, people kind of take chances. The Ayudantes hang further out the door, they jump off quicker, they jump back in, uh, this kind of thing. And so overcrowding definitely contributes. It also changes the waiting on the buses, and so some of the major accidents were, uh, I was told, had to do with overcrowding, where uh, people kind of lost tr uh, control of the bus because of uh, the weight and the, how it was distributed. Competition is a big thing. I think this may actually be in Africa, and there's not a chicken bus on this picture, but I thought it was kind of a cool picture. And it might be something that might happen in Guatemala City when all of the different buses converge and they need to get out of there. People take chances through this. If somebody wants, whoa, sorry, whoa, 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 go back. So if somebody wants to get off and go here, they might let you out of the door here, and then you have to walk across traffic, that kind of thing. Uh, this is a situation that often happens where these two buses might be on the same route, and this one is stopped to do something, and this one will go ahead or pull ahead and offload and onload very quickly and try to get ahead. Um, so this was a big issue. There was also passing that often happened when they were in route, sometimes on curves or windy roads. Um, so the, the, the safety, the hazards there are, are pretty obvious when you're in the buses. And you're like, wow, this is a big thing. Uh, next are those narrow, windy roads. It's a very mountainous area with um, blind, hairpin turns, very narrow roads. Uh, here is one that just kind of turned over because it was narrow coming around a corner. Here's one, the road's actually up here. They, it fell off a cliff because it's very narrow right on a kind of a precipitous fall and the bus falls off and people die, you know. Um, and like I said, people, those pilotos would pass on the, on the corners or uh, certain situations and I wasn't sure how they were judging safety but they do it. The other thing that is just, uh, someone talked about pedestrians and how, how much that contributes. This is a big issue in Guatemala where bus, uh, bicycles are trying to be in the same spaces as uh, the buses. There's a market here, so everything's kind of congested. Also, a lot of the walkways and bicycling areas are um, just very narrow, and it's a pretty unsafe place. Okay. So this, this slide is also from the WHO, and it talks about the percentage of people okay, in the different regions of the country who are either drivers, uh, cyclists, pedestrians, or maybe they don't know, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so among car occupants, about uh, worldwide, about 31% of traffic deaths, it's the car occupant that dies, okay? The majority of the time, it's somebody else who dies, um, such as the pedestrians make up a large uh, section, uh, almost equal, 22%. In some areas, uh, the pedestrians, uh, Africa is a place where the pedestrians are almost as much as the uh, Western Pacific, the percentage of people who are killed in tra traffic fatalities, it's more pedestrians than car oc occupants, uh, th that's the case. Cyclists, the, it kind of depends on how the the, uh, in the Western Pacific, there's a lot of mopeds, this kind of thing, and so a lot of people, uh, it's very dangerous to be on a moped in the uh, Western Pacific. Okay, so 
kind of interesting. So they talk about the WHO report talks a lot about vulnerable road users and one the, kind of the next wave of decreasing uh, traffic fatalities is to try to protect passengers, protect cyclists, uh, protect people on mopeds. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how that might happen. So the WHO report talks about the five kind of key factors that contribute to uh, road safety, okay, uh, road safety problems, and then the five factors for improving them. So in the area of urban speed laws, so speed limits, not so much uh, as you're driving on a straight road in the middle of nowhere where no one lives, uh, but in cities, what's the speed limit? And uh, is that thought about and accounted for? Uh, drunk driving laws, somebody asked that question and that's a great, um, great point and one of the five factors for us to talk about. Uh, the next is motorcycle helmet laws and we'll talk about each of these a little bit more. Seatbelt laws and child restraint laws, okay? Some of these are issues more in the United States uh, or d more developed countries, but a lot of them have themes also in a, um, application in uh, less developed countries. So first, urban speed laws. I kind of made this bit slide a little bit too busy, but basically in almost every municipality in the United States, like on uh, Higgins, next to Hellgate, the speed limit is 25, okay? That's <coughs> typical urban speed limit, um, which is 50 kilometers per hour, which actually literally would be 31 miles per hour. I've never seen a sign like this, but I kind of thought that was kind of interesting, so I threw it in there. And this is why. Um, if a pedestrian is hit, uh, or 10 pedestrians are hit by a vehicle uh, traveling at 20 miles per hour, nine of them were, will survive, one will die, okay? As the speed goes up, the survival goes down, okay? So if the cars are traveling at 30 miles per hour, half of them will live, half will die, and if uh, it's a, at a rate of 40 miles per hour, uh, only one out of the 10 pedestrians will live, okay? So the data is pretty, pretty powerful here to say people should be driving slow in cities. Um, unfortunately, only 59 countries in the world have con comprehensive urban speed laws, okay? The United States isn't one of them because we have states' rights, which is kind of a big thing, and different states have different rules around this kind of thing. Uh, and, but basically, everything in green and yellow are the different countries that have an urban uh, speed limits of equal to or less than 50 kilometers per hour, which is 31 miles per hour, okay? Um, I think the United States is pretty close to this on a, a sub-national level, um, so it's kind of limited how it, uh, it takes into account Canada and the United States because typically we see those lower speed limits in municipalities. Like in Hall, Montana, if you're driving to, out to Discovery, between Drummond and uh, Phillipsburg, there's a little town there called Hall where you have to slow down to 25. It's like there's five houses there, but you need to slow down. And if you don't, well, there is one cop car that I see sometimes in that town. So I assume there must be some enforcement of that law, okay? So next are drunk driving laws, okay? There's a lot of um, media attention to this. Mothers against dr drunk drivers have really drawn a lot of attention to this. There's the crosses on the side of the roads. And so in the United States, this is a major contributor to uh, traffic fatalities. Um, so 89 countries have comprehensive drunk driving laws. Um, one of the issues is what level that's set at. Most of the states in the United States are set at 0 .08 grams per deciliter. So a lot higher, you can be a lot more drunk or buzzed bef uh, and be allowed to drive in the United States. Um, whereas then the worldwide WHO recommendation is for less than 0 0.5 grams per deciliter, okay? Over half of the traffic fatalities in the world are related to drinking. And I think that's a kind of a key factor for us to think about. Um, and it's a major issue in, uh, here in Montana. So a global health issue affecting us here in our state. So motorcycle helmet laws. Now this data is a little bit fuzzy, but hang with me here, okay? So a lot of rules about this in the late 80s, early 90s, 1980s, 1990s. 
more and more states were having uh, motorcycle helmet laws. There was some pushback about people. Why are you going to tell me to ride a hel use a helmet when I ride? It's my head, you know, this kind of thing. So some of the states weakened their laws, okay, and traffic fatality rates went up during that time, okay? They increased during that time, and uh, helmet use went down during that time. I think there's more and more awareness of this and more and more of the helmets are kind of cool looking or have, you know, skull and crossbones or something so people want to wear them. Um, and so I think helmet use is, uh, data-wise, maybe that uptick is kind of going a little bit further since 2006, I'm not sure. But my sense is that there's more helmets on there. So 90 countries have comprehensive motorcycle helmet laws. Again, the United States is an outlier here because different states take different tacts on this. Um, and that's kind of a, a key point. Um, next are seatbelt laws that I was going to talk about. And so the, this guide here is basically that the ones in red, this is primary enforcement. And this, this is a relatively, this is as of 2009. So I think this has actually changed in Montana within the last couple of years. I think we now have primary enforcement. And that is that if somebody sees you driving without your seatbelt on, you can get pulled over and get a ticket for it. But when they first put the seatbelt laws in, it was like, I don't want you pulling me over just because I don't have my seatbelt on. This is kind of a, a libertarian argument that um, uh, kind of set in in certain places. And so yellow is kind of secondary enforcement. You need to pull me over for something else. If I'm swerving like I might be drunk and I don't have my seatbelt on, you can tack on that additional fine. Or speeding and they see you moving over the seatbelt as the police are getting out of the car, they can give you that secondary ticket. But they're not supposed to pull you over in these places where they have the yellow sign, okay? And then green is kind of interesting. There's one state in the country, New Hampshire, and I don't know, is anybody here from New Hampshire? No. All right. Those of us who have spent some time in New Hampshire know that this is a place like no income tax, no sales tax. It's kind of live free or die or, uh, you know, this kind of thing. It's the most libertarian state in the country. Uh, it's interesting that it decides uh, a lot of our elections. Um, with the New Hampshire primary being so early in the election cycle, but this is their law, okay? It's primary enforcement for those under 18, but then once you get older, it has, it's secondary enforcement, okay? So kind of a different way. Anyway, I think the, the key point is that um, there's no national standard for this. And so 111 of the countries have comprehensive seatbelt laws. And this is kind of important because for a single auto accident, for a car occupant, for uh, someone in the front seat, the, the risk of fatality decreases by 70% for someone sitting in the front seat. For someone in the back seat, if you're wearing your seatbelt versus not, it's a decrease in 50%. So it's, it's pretty protective to wear a seatbelt. Uh, so it's a kind of a good idea to do it. And it's good for countries to um, make these laws. And so all of this green, you can see, well, if you have Russia and Canada, you've got a lot of area that's green. But uh, still, a lot of, of 111 uh, countries have the seatbelt laws. Child restraint laws. And this, I don't know if, it, for those of you who've traveled to different countries, um, I've traveled with my kids to different places. We went to Peru, and w I don't think we brought anything for our kids, like in terms of child restraint seats. I don't remember that. I don't think so. Um, but actually, a lot of these countries have laws on this, uh, which is kind of interesting. I like this picture right here because it really is pretty straightforward. It helps you know that a baby is supposed to be in a car seat rear facing. As they get a year older or more, actually, the recommendation just changed to two years old. Um, it's very protective to be rear facing in a car seat. So the recommendation is if the kid can tolerate it, have them rear facing until two years of age. Uh, forward facing until like they're four or a certain weight, I think it's 40 pounds. And then they can go to a booster seat uh, until they're I think 70 pounds, maybe age 10 or something like that, seven, eight or something. Uh, but this, I like this because you don't have to know all of the ages and pounds and that kind of thing. You get an idea that, yeah, my seven-year-old, she's about that big. It'd be good for her to be in a booster seat. Or, yeah, they just need a seat belt because they're a little bit bigger and it fits across them a certain way, okay? This, uh, this other part of this slide here is uh, the, the state by state legislation. Like, what's the laws about um, the use of child restraint 
Um, and so some states, as you can see, Wyoming and Tennessee come out uh, for kids up to eight years, eight. They need to be in a uh, child restraint. Uh, others are uh, kind of the medium blue or uh, six to seven year olds. And then these other ones, like Montana, are just you need to have your kids in a child restraint uh, up until they're five years old. That's the law in Montana. So interestingly, I, I had no idea about this. I keep it in mind next time I uh, travel abroad, is that half of the countries in the United States have a child restraint law, okay? You know, a lot of the enforcement around these rules, so drunk driving, uh, seat belts, child restraints, uh, they're kind of culturally motivated. They get triggered, people see it, so then they start enforcing it, this kind of thing. There's a big educational component about this. Um, so there's, in a lot of places, not such great enforcement of these problems. So um, in high income, as you'd ex expect, countries have good laws and good enforcements, uh, whereas in uh, poorer countries, um, such as low-income countries, they don't have the laws or they may have the law, but there's little to no enforcement of the laws. So one thing to know about th this issue as it relates worldwide is that actually traffic uh, fatality rates are increasing in the United States. So it's the ninth leading cause of death worldwide. Uh, by 2020, it's uh, projected to be the fifth leading cause. You know, maybe you've heard about treatment of HIV in this course, uh, some of the respiratory diseases, immunizations, these kinds of things. We're making progress in those, uh, but some of these things we're, we're not doing so well. So high-income uh, high countries, more of them are seeing decreased numbers of deaths. Middle-income countries, it's about the same, but in the low-income countries, actually, as they maybe get a little bit more wealth, more cars, they become more like middle-income countries and have higher traffic fatality rates, uh, which is unfortunate. And so this is a, a big public health issue worldwide that's increasing in scope. So what, what are we doing about it? Over the last five years, so from 2008 until the WHO report in 2013, 35 countries passed new laws, uh, but still about only 7% of the countries in the world, or, or the world population, I'm sorry, is covered for all five risk factors, okay? So this is kind of a busy slide, okay? But basically here we have the percentage of the world's population that's covered by urban speed limit laws, okay? So you can see a little bit of increase from 2008 to 2011. A little more of the population got covered for urban speed limit laws, for drunk driving, for helmet use, for seat belts, and for child restraints. And all five of the factors, some of the countries clicked in and say, okay, WHO recommends this, we're gonna go all five on this and we're gonna try to improve our rates this way. They also have a rating of enforcement. So how good is the enforcement in these different countries? So I'd assume in uh, Washington, D.C., for example, the enforcement is quite good. There's a, a large police presence. Uh, uh, there's monitoring. Um, I think in Hall, Montana, I think the chance of getting pulled over for not quite going 25 through that town is a lot lower. And I think that's part of why the traffic fatality rate is a lot higher in, in rural uh, states is that there's just not police in some of the places to enforce all of these rules. Um, so in terms of traffic, uh, I, I wanted to highlight the, the drug driving laws on this. Uh, you know, working on the Indian Reservation in Zuni, New Mexico, very remote place, speed limit was 25 coming through town, um, and there was a lot of drunk driving and traffic fatalities related to that that really affected the community. Uh, one thing that w went on a lot was is that they would have checkpoints, so sobriety checkpoints where they would stop the road between Gallup, which was the next the closest town, uh, and Zuni, and they'd pull everybody over, check your ID, and talk to you long enough to see if they think you might be drunk, and if you are, they, you know, you get a DWI, this kind of thing. Uh, so there, there's things that states are trying to do. One thing is if there was a um, a checkpoint, people would talk about it to say, oh, there's gonna be a checkpoint today, so don't be drinking and driving on this day, you know? Um, so there, there's ways around these things, but I think the more enforcement, there's more awareness of it, uh, and then as more people are affected, I think that more people will um, 
um, observe these laws. But I still think as you're getting into national ratings of which countries have good enforcement of these laws, um, certainly in rural areas in the United States, we're, we don't do so well in enforcement. And then in terms of the number of countries, again, 195 countries in this survey, okay, typically, you know, the enforcement is going to be less than a quarter of those countries have good enforcement, okay? Others have fair or poor or none at all. I think the other I issue is how do countries uh, think about the more vulnerable populations to traffic fatalities? So how, where do cyclists, do they have their own lanes? Uh, where do walkers go? Unless, in some parts of the United States, unless you live on a cul-de-sac, there's not a great place for kids to play and be out uh, where they can play. It actually can be very uh, dangerous. And so, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these countries, I think it's an increasing awareness that people don't have a place to play and walk and ride bikes and find other ways to transport themselves. Um, but still, only 35% of the countries have policies which promote walking and cycling. And most of them, as you'd expect, are in the European uh, region. So then we come down to near the end here, talking about the WHO recommendations. And so, again, this is 2013 WHO report. Their feeling is that the pace of legislation is slow um, and there needs to be in, increased adoption of these comprehensive laws. So all five factors, we need to have all five of these factors covered. I think personally that enforcement is a bigger issue, even in the United States where we have a lot of these laws, enforcement is not great. And a lot of the traffic fatalities in Montana uh, and Wyoming have to do with lack of enforcement. It's not that we don't have the laws and our rates are as high as they are in Africa where maybe they don't have the laws. So I think enforcement is a huge issue for us. Um, and then this point about uh, reducing traffic deaths um, has to do with considering where are pedestrians, where are people going to play, walk, cycle, um, and trying to separate those places. So cars are here, like interstates uh, or uh, separated areas, uh, and then there's bike lanes, there's uh, uh, sidewalks or designated walking areas where people can get exercise and take care of other public health issues that we have. And then infrastructure is a huge thing. I think it's impossible to talk about the developing countries and um, like the United States and more developed countries without talking about the infrastructure. The roads in Guatemala are incredibly narrow, windy. They're just trying to get over a hill. Whereas here in the United States, we would plow, a, you know, put in an interstate, for example, I-90 as it goes into Idaho is super, it could be super windy, and it is a little windy, and you have to slow down a little bit, but it's, uh, the infrastructure is a huge issue, and so public investment in that infrastructure, not just in terms of how do you get a, a, through a, a windy region or up over hills, um, but also how do you develop the infrastructure within cities to protect back to here, again, the pedestrians, the cyclists, the motorcyclists, to try to keep the other users of the road safe. I think uh, infrastructural uh, um, investment, I think, is a big part of what's going to make a big difference in this in the long run. So my conclusions to my talk are kind of, uh, kind of gone over the WHO recommendations, but this is my take home of this issue as I've revisited it. 13 years after studying this in Guatemala and uh, kind of revisiting for you all. And I think the thing that I want to highlight, first of all, is really that global health issues are also local. The tra traffic fatality rate in Montana is as high as uh, many of the less developed countries in the world. And so we can look at home and some of the different issues to get involved in these issues and try to reduce some of the disparities between smaller towns and uh, larger cities, um, Indian reservations or not, or, uh, or whatever the issue, the global health issue that you're interested in. Um, I think it's important to think that there's, to know that there's opportunities to be involved locally. 
Uh, I also, uh, kind of a key conclusion here is that those rural states have the high traffic fatality rates um, and that there's a de increasing traffic deaths in the developing countries, which is very concerning and uh, action needs to be taken to, uh, um, to turn that around. So and then I just listed out some references for you all to look at. A lot of this is just searchable on the web um, to get this information. For those who want more information, like if you guys are writing your paper for this, I think the, w uh, the rates by state is pretty cool. So you can look back through there and see which states. Um, and you can just Google US tra uh, traffic fatality rates by state uh, to be able to look at the different rates and it's amazing that Wyoming is so much higher. It's like 28 traffic fatalities per 100,000 uh, people whereas DC is like so low, so small, you know, kind of interesting. And then the WHO report is a really, really great report so that for that you just um, put in 2013 WHO traffic safety report and it has a ton of different information, um, a lot of this data and that sort of thing. So. So I look forward to reading your papers. It'll be very exciting. Um, are there any questions people might have? Yeah. Excuse me, uh, could you tell me uh, um, which percent of the country cover the fire Um Yeah, so that's on this slide right back here. So uh, well, actually, this is the percentage of the world's population uh, about 8% looks like 8% um, of the world's population is covered by all five le legislation and laws in all five practice. I think there was something about the number of countries though. I think it was 35 countries maybe have um, the more comprehensive um, all, all five factors covered. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to comment on the rural-urban difference as a factor of time and distance from the crash site to the ER? I mean, we have times in Montana that are 90 minutes or more. Where in D.C., you're probably there within 10. That, that's, uh, for those, who, I don't know if everybody heard that comment, but it's a great point why uh, traffic fatality rates are higher in Wyoming and Montana. Uh, I mean, there's a couple things. It's per 100,000 people. So Wyoming only has like 400,000 people in the whole state. And so you, you have a lot lower denominator that way that will give you a higher uh, rate in terms of that. But she makes a really great point in that there's parts of the United States that um, are really far from um, emergency services. Um, I don't know, it's like the Sealy Swan Valley, for example, if you're driving up by Condon and you get in a major car accident there, it could be a long time before you're at St. Pat's ER or maybe you get flown to uh, Kalispell Regional. I think in the United States we have a lot of advantages that way that we have 911 where people get called, they identify the place, they have life flight to get a helicopter in and get people places, but it's true that in uh, still in Montana, it's a longer time before someone with first aid training will be there in the first place that maybe would make a difference. And then definitive treatment in a tertiary care facility like uh, Kalispell Regional or St. Pat's or uh, this kind of place is, uh, you know, even farther in time. That's a great point. Any other questions people have or points to make? I, I didn't realize that I would have a couple of personal experiences to share on this topic myself. Um, but um, having driven through Hall, Montana uh, many times, probably over 100 times, uh, there was one time when I forgot to stop, slow down when I was going into Hall because I was engrossed in a great conversation with a graduate student not about this people. And I got ticketed. So they do enforce in Hall, Montana. I just want to let you know that. $60. Um, that was about 10 years ago. So I'm um, the other experience I wanted to share with you is my Nigeria experience. Um, when I was teaching in Nigeria, it seemed like, I'm sure I'm exaggerating, but it seemed like every week we lost one of my colleagues from the university on a road accident. And, and those are not urban road accidents. Those were road accidents between Zaria, where the university was, and Kaduna, capital of the province or the next big city, Kano. And um, 
So I'm leading up to a question for you, John. Um, so I wish I had a slide of this, but I can still see it in my mind. It's burned into my mind forever. I had to drive to Kaduna quite frequently because I was doing my research in Kaduna. And there was one trip when I was driving to Kaduna, and it was a two-lane road, but it had a shoulder. And I was driving to Kaduna, and a car was overtaking the car that was coming towards me and was in my lane. And uh, before I could do anything about it, a car started to, I don't know what you call this, undertake the person who was in the opposite lane on the shoulder on the opposite side. And then another car started to pass the person who was in my lane on the shoulder on my side. So I had four vehicles coming at me at the same time. And you know, all I could do was close my eyes and pray, but somehow I'm still here. So they all got back onto the road at the same time and I didn't crash into any of them. But my question for you is, you didn't mention anything about education and licensing. I think that part of it is training people to be good drivers. I think that's a great that's a great point. I think that goes along with a lot of the infrastructural uh, issues that wasn't highlighted in the WHO report. It's not something that I reported on here, but I think that that would be in line with the countries that are invested in uh, making the laws to raise awareness about these things, um, and then also um, ha put money into enforcement and uh, enforce these laws are probably the countries that are more likely to have certification to require people to have licenses to drive and have an educational component to that. Um, but that would just be my answer uh, off the top of my head here. Okay, let's give John a round of applause. Thank you.